Advanced Ion Propulsion Systems Ion propulsion is a much more efficient means of moving a spacecraft than chemical rocket engines. So why isn't Elon Musk planning to use it on Starship? Why doesn't every spaceship use it? Ion propulsion uses an electromagnetic force to propel charged atoms called ions from the engine, pushing the spacecraft in the opposite direction in accordance with Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. There are two types of rocket engines in general use right now, chemical and ionic. When I discuss ion engines, I usually include the Vassimer or Variable Specific Impulse Magnetohydrodynamic Rocket, but some do not consider the Vassimer an ion engine, and they are correct. A true ion drive uses electromagnetic force to propel an ion out the back of the engine. The Vassimer ionizes the gas so that it can be manipulated by electromagnetic forces, but heats the gas with radio waves until it is ejected out the back by thermal rather than electromagnetic energy. The electromagnetic fields are used to move the propellant through the engine and to keep it from touching the sides of the engine, as the propellant is heated to a temperature higher than that of the surface of the sun. No known material could withstand that heat. I do not include it in today's training on ion drives because it is dependent on ionic propellant, but technically it is an electrothermal rocket engine. There are several different types of ion drives. All ion drives are energy intensive. They need a lot of power relative to their size. Chemical rocket engines produce energy during combustion and propellant from the products of combustion. Let's look at a hydrogen-fueled rocket engine. It has tanks for liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Pumps move the liquid from the tanks to the combustion chamber. These pumps are usually powered by the same chemical fuel and oxidizer that propel the rocket. In many engines, a small amount of fuel and oxidizer is burned in a pre-burner and used to power a turbo pump to move the fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. In many systems, the fuel is circulated around the hottest parts of the engine, like the nozzle, before it is pumped into the combustion chamber. This allows the engine to run at extremely high temperatures without destroying itself. The chemical rocket does not need an outside source of power. It can, in fact, make power from this burning fuel and generate electricity if it wants to, though most rockets have a separate system for that. Let's also separate chemical engines into two types, monopropellant and bipropellant. Monopropellant chemical engines can use a catalyst to break down a large molecule into smaller molecules, generating heat from this reaction. The larger molecule can be looked at as the fuel and the smaller ones as the propellant. An example of rocket engines like this are the hydrazine thrusters used by Ariane Space. The hydrazine thrusters come in 1 newton, 20 newton, and 400 newton sizes. The hydrazine is passed over a catalyst bed that breaks the hydrazine, which is N2H2, into nitrogen and hydrogen gas, and a little ammonia that breaks down with more hydrazine into nitrogen and hydrogen. Heat energy is generated and pressure builds in the combustion chamber. A throat holds back that pressure and channels the random kinetic energy in the combustion chamber in one direction, out the nozzle. These engines are simple and robust. You can have a pressurized tank of hydrazine, open a valve and let some hydrazine spray into the catalyst bed. The breakdown reaction occurs and the hot hydrogen and nitrogen gas are expelled out the nozzle generating force. These can be pulsed or fired continuously. Hydrogen peroxide can be used in this type of engine also. Hydrazine may soon be replaced by the less toxic HAM or hydroxyl ammonium nitrate, which is dissolved into a solution of water, methanol, and ammonia. This fuel has a higher specific impulse and a higher impulse density. You can also just have a tank of pressurized gas that you release into a chamber with a nozzle and throat. The expansion of the gas will generate some thrust. These are like the cold gas thrusters you see SpaceX using to control its Starhopper and Falcon 9. You will see puffs of gas coming from these. The cold gas can also be heated by electricity to increase the thrust produced. These are being used in the newer upper stages by United Launch Alliance in the Advanced Common Evolved Stage or ACES. The ACES second stage uses hydrogen gas that boils off from its liquid hydrogen tanks and heats the gas in the thruster. This eliminates the need for hydrazine or helium in their design. A bipropellant rocket engine would be like the one used in the Ariane 5 rocket. This rocket burns hydrogen fuel and oxygen in the Vulcane engine, producing water. The superheated water is the propellant. So chemical engines burn or combust a fuel producing energy, either by breaking down a larger molecule, like the hydrazine monopropellant engines, or combining two smaller ones, like the Vulcane. 
the most energetic chemical reaction we have for rocket fuel is hydrogen oxygen or hydrolox as it is called. This combination produces a specific impulse of 440 to 455 seconds in space. This means that one kilogram of hydrogen burned with the right amount of oxygen can levitate one kilogram against Earth's gravity for up to 455 seconds. This is how we measure rocket engine efficiency. If we know that Earth's standard gravity at 9.8 meters per second squared is the standard we have decided to use, and we know the equation propellant ejection velocity equals specific impulse times one Earth G, then we can multiply 455 by 9.81 and calculate that the ejection velocity out the back of a Hydrolox engine is about 4,464 meters per second. Because it is easier to throw a light object fast and exhaust velocity is important, Hydrolox engines will put in more hydrogen than it can burn. This extra hydrogen is heated and thrown out the back at a very high velocity, generating more thrust and a higher efficiency. Ion engines are different. They do not produce power the way a chemical rocket does. In fact, they need a huge amount of outside energy. This energy must come from somewhere. A lot of small satellites use ion engines and they get their energy from solar power. The sun's flux or energy output at the orbit of the Earth is about 1400 watts per square meter. Only about 20 to at most 40 percent of this energy can be turned into electricity. So for a small satellite with a solar panel one meter square, we are looking at 280 to 560 watts. Most ion thrusters being used today need 1 to 7 kilowatts of electrical energy to function. They are about 65 to 80 percent efficient while chemical engines are up to 98 percent efficient. Ion engines can generate an exhaust velocity of 20 to 50 kilometers per second with a thrust of 25 to 250 millinewtons. Although the X3 hull thruster has produced 5.4 newtons. This amount of force produced is tiny compared to even small chemical rocket engines. The difference is that the ion engine can fire for weeks or even years while the chemical engine will only burn for a few moments before it has used all its fuel and oxidizer. This will generate a much higher velocity in the end with the ion engine with a lot less propellant mass used. Now let's look at the different types of ion engines and how they work. A moving electrical charge creates a magnetic field or force. A moving magnetic field can generate an electrical force. If an atom or molecule has a charge, it can be moved by electric or magnetic fields. We call these atoms or molecules ions. Neutral particles cannot be moved by electric or magnetic fields. Let's assume we have a source of electrical power. Solar, nuclear, chemical fuel cells, etc. Some of this power must be used to ionize the gas we are going to use as propellant. We must usually knock an electron off the atom so it will have a charge and we can manipulate it with electric or magnetic fields. The easiest gases to ionize are the noble gases. These include, in order of ascending atomic mass, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. In a chemical engine, a certain amount of heat or kinetic energy is imparted to the propellants by the process of combustion. Since the rocket equation tells us that the change in velocity is proportional to the ejection velocity of the propellant, we want particles of propellant to go as fast as possible. This means using a low mass molecule or atom so it can reach a higher velocity. In an ion engine, the electromagnetic force can throw everything at about the same velocity. In this case, it is better to throw a heavier atom so we get more momentum. A cannonball going 100 kilometers per hour has more momentum than a golf ball going the same speed. Of the easily ionized noble gases, radon is the heaviest with an atomic mass of 222. This gas is radioactive, however, and would be dangerous to work with. Xenon is the next heaviest with a mass of 131. It is the best gas to use, but is quite rare and expensive. Krypton is a good compromise between expense and mass at about 84. Argon is the most abundant noble gas on the Earth and Mars with a mass of about 40 atomic mass units. Neon only has a mass of 20 and helium 4. Helium is so light that most of it has been stripped from the top of Earth's atmosphere by the solar winds. We find pockets of it trapped in the ground while mining from radioactive decay of other elements. There are several types of ion thrusters. The first we will look at is a field emission electric propulsion thruster. This uses a liquid metal, usually cesium, indium, or mercury as a propellant. The very first ion drive to function in space was a Soviet cesium-based ion drive. The FEEP drive uses an emitter and an accelerator electrode. A potential electrical difference of 10,000 volts is applied between the two. 
which generates a strong electric field at the tip of the metal surface. Instabilities called Taylor cones form on the surface of the liquid metal. Ions form at this interface and are accelerated away from the engine at about 100,000 meters per second or more. An electron gun must fire electrons away from the ship to keep it electrically neutral. This gives us an extremely high specific impulse. Remember that ejection velocity equals the specific impulse times Earth's standard gravity. So specific impulse equals VE over GE. 100,000 meters per second divided by 9.8 meters per second squared gives 10,193 seconds for specific impulse. It can, however, only move a small number of atoms this way. So the mass fuel flow is extremely low. This gives an extremely low thrust of only a few millinewtons at best. It is, however, used in the European Space Agency's Pathfinder satellite, which had a mass of 480 kilograms at the start of its mission. For this type of ion drive, remember, liquid metals, Heavy atoms like cesium and rubidium work best. They melt easily and ionize easily. Capillary forces are used to move the propellant to the tip of the device so you do not need tanks or valves. An accelerating electrode is placed in front of the emitter. It is usually made of stainless steel with two sharp blades. When activated, a strong electric field is generated by applying a high voltage difference between the electrode and the emitter. This strong field at the surface of the liquid forms instabilities called Taylor cones. When the voltage reaches about 10 to the 9th volts per meter, these instabilities ionize the atoms there and eject streams of individual atoms at about 100,000 meters per second. The electrons stay in the liquid and must be ejected to prevent a charge buildup on your thruster. These are good for CubeSats and a 0.5 millinewton FEEP is commercially available. Next, let's look at radio frequency thrusters. These were first demonstrated in space in 1992 by the European Space Agency's Eureka satellite. The RIT-2X, for Radio Ion Technology, is a working commercial thruster of this type. These use a high frequency electromagnetic field to ionize xenon gas atoms into plasma. Remember that plasma is the name for a gas that has been stripped of its electrons. The ions or charged atoms are then accelerated by an electrostatic field and ejected for thrust. The electrons are streamed after the ion plasma to maintain a neutral overall charge on the thruster. The Orbital Propulsion Center at Ariane Group has three radio frequency ion technology thruster models available. The RIT Micro X can produce 50 to 500 micronewtons and is good for very precise small movements in space. RIT 10 EVO can produce from 5 to 25 millinewtons. RIT 2X can produce from 80 to 205 millinewtons. You will note that these are gridded ion thrusters, meaning they create an electric force on a grid and the ions are accelerated toward that grid, go through the grid, and off into space. Some impact the grid and this design can suffer erosion of the grid over time. A radio frequency thruster was used by ESA when a chemical engine failed and was able to move a satellite from medium Earth orbit to geosynchronous Earth orbit over several months. Pulse Plasma Thrusters Pulse Plasma Thrusters use a solid propellant. Two electrodes have a powerful capacitor connected to them. The capacitor charges to a high voltage, then discharges across the surface of the solid propellant when an igniter spark is sent between them. Some of the propellant is ablated from the solid and turned into a plasma. This plasma is called the main discharge. The powerful electric field created between the two electrodes creates a strong magnetic field at right angles to it, and this is called the Lorentz force. This magnetic field ejects the plasma out of the thruster at high velocity. As the solid propellant is burned away, a spring or other device advances the solid propellant into the path of the electrode. This device is made of a power source, usually solar, a power processing unit, the energy storage unit or capacitor, and the thruster itself. Now let's look at Hall Effect thrusters. These use an intense radiomagnetic field of about 30 millitesla, moving around the circumference of an annular ceramic channel to ionize propellant creating plasma. An electric field of between 150 and 800 volts is applied between the cathode and anode along the axial channel. The anode has small channels in it through which the propellant flows. These atoms are hit by high-speed electrons that are circulating around in the magnetic field. These electrons strike the atoms and ionize them, turning them into plasma. The ions of which then accelerate toward the cloud of electrons at the opening of the thrust chamber. This accelerates the plasma to more than 80,000 meters per second. This plasma takes electrons with it, but these are replaced by the power source, usually solar. Edwin Hall discovered this effect, and the thrusters are named in his honor. 
The subjection velocity would give a specific impulse of over 8,000, but in practice most produce about 1,600 seconds of specific impulse. This is still three times better than the most efficient chemical rocket engine available. These usually use xenon or krypton, though they can also work with argon, bismuth, iodine, magnesium, and zinc. Small devices using 1.3 kilowatts to produce 83 millinewtons of force have been used, and the large X3 Hall Effect thruster has produced a record 5.4 newtons of force with about 45 to 60 percent electric power to thrust efficiency. The Soviets designed good working Hall Effect thrusters first in the 1960s, with the Americans focusing on gridded thrusters. The first use of these thrusters was aboard a Meteor spacecraft in December 1971 by the Soviet Union. Over 200 of this type of thruster has been flown by the Russians with no failures. They are now used on some European satellites with the first being the Lunar Smart One in 2003 by the European Space Agency and the American Taxat 2 in 2010. Hall effect thrusters have also been tested on the X-37B space plane. The SpaceX Starlink satellites use Hall Effect thrusters with Krypton propellant. The main benefit of the Hall Effect thruster is that it uses a cloud of electrons instead of a grid to attract and accelerate the ions. This prevents corrosion of a grid. Axion Systems uses a non-toxic liquid salt based propellant. They avoid the use of ionization chambers, pressurized tanks and valves. They designed a chip with wells of propellant. They apply a powerful electric field to accelerate the ions for thrust. This is called electrospray propulsion and is like how inkjet printers work. The conversion efficiency of this system can be 60% higher than plasma thrusters and it has potential. In summary, ion drives can be field emission electric propulsion thrusters, radio frequency ion technology thrusters, pulse plasma propulsion thrusters, Hall effect propulsion thrusters, or the new salt based electrospray thruster design. Now if these ion thrusters are so much more efficient than chemical engines, then why doesn't every spaceship use them? Why doesn't Elon Musk plan to put them on his starship? The problem is that these thrusters don't provide their own power like a chemical rocket does. You need an outside power source. This is almost always solar for satellites and these systems work great for small objects that can take their time getting somewhere. They also work great for very long range missions like Deep Space One and New Horizons. Over many years, these spacecraft reached speeds that could not have been achieved with any chemical engine. But people usually don't have nine years to get somewhere. New Horizons was launched in 2006 and arrived at Pluto in 2015. If we want to have real thrust from an ion drive, we will have to use a lot of power. Modern spacecraft do not have big enough solar panels to generate that much power. The next video will be on potential high-speed propulsion systems for transsolar spaceflight using these and electrothermal propulsion with the Vassimer engine by Dr. Chang Diaz. Thank you for listening and stay safe.